Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. Uh, well, I suppose at this point we'll either go up or down the uh, anthropometric scales, depending on your own point of view. Uh, but interest in non-human primate models of atherosclerosis uh, has increased substantially over the past 20 years. And I think some of the reasons for that are that uh, atherosclerosis is such a complicated disorder that it's clearly uh, related to psychosocial phenomena. So one needs a model uh, uh, that can be manipulated uh, uh, behaviorally and has s certain psychosocial relationships to human beings. And other matters that relate to the reproductive system, uh, there clearly are important male-female differences, and females in our society at least have been by tradition protected against coronary artery disease. Uh, there is some evidence now that females are losing that protection. Uh, as, their, as their rights go up, their coronary artery protection seems to go down. <laughs> so one, uh, one needs models of, uh, that mimic human beings in this regard so that some of these matters uh, of, of female protection can be studied better. And then I think finally there is the sort of a basic feeling that if you're dealing with a disease that you don't understand very well, and, uh, either its causes or its cures, that you're somehow more secure in your investments in research if you invest in an animal model that kind of looks like human beings and acts like human beings. And uh, most assuredly then one concludes that whatever you find out will be more important to human beings. That, uh, that link really uh, remains to be shown, but it... Uh, it's very much in the minds of, of federal decision makers, I think, that decide where resources should be allocated uh, and researched by such institutes as the NHLBI. So uh, starting about 1960, uh, we recognized that to be fashionable in atherosclerosis research, uh, we had to become medical primatologists along with, uh, with our other colleagues. And I believe we'll just start with the first slide. I'll have to tell you a little bit of a story about how we got involved with squirrel monkeys. and uh, <laughs> It's a little bit of a story like our white car and old pigeon story, and it shows you the value of good planning and careful critique of what you do over the years. Starting in, in about 1960, uh, when we decided that it was essential that we have primate models in our program, we decided we were going to be a little different from others, and we were going to... Uh, uh, choose our primate model in a very thoughtful and carefully planned way. And uh, so we had a series of thinking sessions and we decided, well, first of all, we should choose a primate that existed in our hemisphere so we could just tip off to their natural habitat whenever we wanted to and to conduct studies. So that said, well, we had to use South American monkeys if that was important. And then we said, well, we aren't going to just jump in and decide right offhand uh, what South American monkey to use. We were going to take uh, three years to study them in their natural habitat and choose the one that seemed mm -hmm. to most nearly resemble human beings in terms of their plasma lipids and the pathologic characteristics of their arterial lesions. Well, we did that, and it really was a lot of fun. Uh, in collaboration with the LSU School of Medicine, uh, we built a small laboratory in Leticia, Columbia, and over a period of two or three years, did survey uh, all of the monkeys of the Amazon basin in terms of their plasma lipids and the characteristics of their naturally occurring lesions. And it was on that basis that we chose squirrel monkeys. But to show you the value of that kind of planning, uh, although we decided how important it was to have the monkey model that we chose available in this hemisphere so we could do field work on them. Uh, it's now, because of political and other reasons, no longer possible to do field work in Leticia, Colombia, and so it may have well have been in Asia or Africa or anywhere else uh, in that regard. Then the next clever thing we did in critiquing ourselves uh, was in about 1974, uh, 19, in early 1975, we came to another strategic sort of a decision, and that is that it appeared to us that the complications imposed in 
squirrel monkey atherosclerosis by their herpes virus infections uh, were of such magnitude that we should discontinue their use as models in atherosclerosis research. So for 1975 to 1980, we sort of set them on the back, back burner as models of atherosclerosis because of the complications of their herpes virus infections, we thought. Well, you can now appreciate what a clever maneuver that was, uh, the most intriguing and the most fundable thing at this moment in atherosclerosis research <laughs> has to do with the relationship between the herpes viruses and the pathogenesis of the lesions. And so what appeared to be a complication was really a research opportunity knocking on our door and we failed to hear the knock, I'm afraid. <clears throat> Well, what I want to do is to point out what I think are two or three of the major contributions of squirrel monkeys uh, to atherosclerosis research. When we brought them to our institution, uh, we did the first thing we do to visitors and new animal models. We feed them a lot of dietary cholesterol and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, to our surprise, uh, they were tremendously variable in their response. Uh, the response being the amount of increase in their plasma concentrations of cholesterol. I spoke of this earlier. We called it hyper and hypo responsiveness to dietary cholesterol. And uh, one of these columns says males and one says females down here. It doesn't matter which one. They're both the same. I think that's males and that's females. But as you can see among a large group of monkeys, and each monkey is represented by a dot, uh, fed a diet containing one milligram per calorie of cholesterol, there is this big variability with some animals going over 800 milligrams per deciliter and some remaining somewhere between 100 and 300 milligrams per deciliter. And it is these low animals that we've called hypo-responders and these high animals that we've called hyper-responders. Now this same phenomenon goes on in all non-human primates and it goes on in human beings. Uh, we've chosen to feed rather large amounts of cholesterol so we could exaggerate the phenomenon quite a lot. And, and see it. Several people have asked me if I would comment on the report of the Food and Nutrition Board uh, of the National Academy of Science recently, and I'm really happy to do that at every opportunity because uh, I think they made a, a, a very uh, uh, poor conclusion from the data that it did exist. And some of you may know that what they said was that if you are in good health, it doesn't matter if you consume a lot of dietary cholesterol. That was sort of the bottom line of, of that report. But a part of being in good health is that you've been checked by your physician and found that your plasma lipids are normal. <laughs> well, you see, what, what that is is really an extension of this phenomena that I'm talking about. If you're one of these individuals down here, then you would have been an individual that would have been seen by your physician and, and you would have a low plasma lipid because you're not responsive to dietary cholesterol, and then the report is correct. It doesn't matter if you eat dietary cholesterol because you simply can't elevate these animals at this end with dietary cholesterol. On the other hand, if you're one of these individuals up here and you eat dietary cholesterol, then it's likely to have a very adverse effect on your risk factors. So what they say is, in partly, is partly correct. That is, if you have been eating an average American diet and have a normal cholesterol, then it probably doesn't matter about the cholesterol you consume. The unfortunate part of the report is that people forget the front end of it and remember only the end of their recommendation, and that is that it doesn't matter if you eat dietary cholesterol. They forget the part that you must have been challenged with an average American diet and found not to be diet responsive, which is the part called in good health. But at any rate, uh, I think almost everyone agrees now that this hyper and hypo responsiveness to dietary cholesterol is a, is a genetically controlled trait, that it is polygenic in its inheritance, and it was e experiments done at our center with squirrel monkeys that uh, established that this was true. For these studies, we chose four male monkeys, uh, two of these male monkeys being quite hyper responsive to dietary cholesterol and two being uh, non-responsive to dietary cholesterol. These are their responses to two different kinds of diets and you can see they really are, are quite different. Well, in order to approach the measurements of these heritability of the trait, uh, 
we took these four male monkeys and bred them to all the female monkeys we could get our hands on, or perhaps I should say all they could get their hands on. And we produced about 220 progeny uh, over a period of time. Uh, this is one year's progeny, and it depicts what I believe is the, is the happening in every uh, vintage of these babies. Uh, zero time here is at the time of weaning, which in the conditions of this experiment were about four months of age. And the first thing that you can see is that even at the time of weaning and in response to the cholesterol present in their mother's milk, there is a statistically significant difference in the plasma cholesterol concentration of those infants uh, that is determined by the responsiveness of their parents. They were high if their parents were hyper-responders. They were low if their parents were hypo-responders. Now, among the infants that were taken then at the time of weaning and fed a cholesterol-enriched formula, uh, if, they were, if their parents were hyper-responders, you can see that their cholesterol concentrations increased and tended to plateau at a high level. But if their parents were hypo-responders, they made an initial increase, and then they had this metabolic uh, uh, accommodation to the presence of the dietary cholesterol and by seven months of time of feeding the formula, they were about back to weaning age. And, uh, we have, uh, for a period of some number of years now, been seeking the uh, biochemical and physiological explanations for this polygenic trait. It is complicated, and we don't have it thoroughly identified, but it, among the biochemical characteristics that have to do with hyper and hypo responsiveness. Certainly the amount and the way in which dietary cholesterol is absorbed is one of the characteristics. Another of the major characteristics is the way cholesterol is excreted. Something about the way the lipoproteins present the cholesterol to the liver and the enzymes that, that control the conversion of cholesterol to bile acids and its subsequent excretion although that is not uh, completely worked out at this time. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Bullock and I had the patience enough to observe a group of monkeys that were either from hyper or hypo-responsive parents uh, over a five-year period of time to see what the consequence was of their continuing to eat a high-fat diet. And we found that if they, their parents were hypo-responders, uh, it just didn't matter. They were healthy five years later. There were no significant problems caused to the animals. <laughs> like the Academy of Science report, uh, they were in good health, and so it didn't matter to them if they continued to eat cholesterol. But among those whose parents were hyper-responsive to dietary cholesterol, we saw a whole gamut of lesions that are associated with hyperlipidemia, all of which are seen in human beings as well. This is a hand of one of these monkeys, and you can see the palmar xanthomas on the surface of the hands. You can also see that the fingers are somewhat distorted by the presence of tendinous xanthomas as well. A few of the animals, about 15% of those that were hyperlipidemic, do develop xanthomas of the eyelids, which are called xanthalasma. This is an example of an aorta, an abdominal aorta, from one of these hyper-responsive animals. It's been open longitudinally and you can see that it is extensively affected with atherosclerosis, uh, this being about the only normal intimal surface. Uh, here, almost all of the remainder of this abdominal aorta is affected then with extensive and severe atherosclerosis. Some interesting lipid lesions, uh, lipid-associated lesions, occur in association with the heart valves and were associated with fatal congestive heart failure in some number of the animals. You can see a foam cell lesion at the base of this aortic valve. And if one looks at the aortic valve leaflet, one sees a leaflet that is markedly thickened. And you can see that there are lipid clefts, a lot of reactive cells, a lot of mineral. In fact, it looks very much like atherosclerosis looks, but it occurs in this aortic valve. Now, Another interesting lesion of squirrel monkeys that seems to occur more frequently than in other animals is a lesion that in the gross looks like a myocardial infarction. What it is is a rather large focus of myocardial necrosis that's 
likely neurogenic in its origin. You can see this white area. It's hyperemic on its side in this monkey. And one looks at the cut surface. Uh, you can see a, just a gray deal of myocardial necrosis. The first clue that it's not vascular in origin is the fact that it affects several chambers of the heart. You can see here that it affects <coughs> the left ventricle, the interventricular septum, and extends into the right ventricle to some extent. Now, in recent years, uh, workers at the University of Virginia have carried on a number of uh, studies uh, to determine some of the causes of this myocardial necrosis in squirrel monkeys. Uh, and they've used condition avoidance situation and yoked animals and have rather shown conclusively <laughs> that with intensive conditioned avoidance sorts of presentations, they can reliably induce extensive myocardial necrosis. Presumably it has to do with extreme stress and their unusual cortisol metabolism and some aspects of the uh, potassium flux within the myocardial cells. But we've seen a, a very large number of these cases and it's been our impression that it's always associated with some stressful event like the early weaning of an infant and, and feeding the infant a formula and changing its environment and that sort of thing is often associated with it, or sudden changes in environments or other manipulations in the animals that would uh, presumably be uh, stress-related. If you just see these, you could easily confuse them with a myocardial infarction, however. Another interesting aspect of squirrel monkeys as models is that they do develop cholesterol-containing gallstones in certain situations. This is an example of a gallbladder that's been opened. Uh, to show these gallstones. Uh, we've looked at this problem in fair much detail, as has Oscar Portman at the Oregon Primate Center. And we find that the cholesterol gallstones are associated with the kind of fat that the animals consume. Uh, they seem to share this with human beings, as a matter of fact, that if the diet is high in polyunsaturated fat, a lot of gallstones occur. If the diet's high in saturated fat, uh, then there are few or no gallstones. That's in the opposite direction of what happens to their plasma lipids, because if you feed them an unsaturated fat diet, their plasma cholesterol will go down, their arteries will be better, but their gallstones will be worse. Conversely, if you feed them saturated fat, their plasma cholesterols will be higher, their arteries get worse, but they don't get the gallstone disease. That seems to be a, the same dilemma that goes on in human beings in asso association with polyunsaturated fat or treatment with atrimid or other things that lower plasma lipids. Now, this is an example of the, of the arteritis that one sees uh, among, in squirrel monkeys, often associated with the plaques that are induced by diet. And Dr. Bullock did touch upon that some in his presentation. Uh, this is a rather typical example of arteritis associated with a diet-induced atherosclerotic plaque in a proximal main branch of coronary artery in squirrel monkeys. And interestingly, one rarely sees atherosclerotic plaques in proximal main branches of squirrel monkeys unless there is a focus of arteritis. Now, that suggests to us uh, that in, in re-looking at the herpes story, <laughs> after we're beaten over the head with it by many cat al, that this may very well represent some sort of an immunological injury to that artery uh, or some direct viral effect of one of the squirrel monkey herpes viruses on the artery, which does then make it susceptible to, to atherosclerosis. Uh, Dr. Lehner is proposing to study this in some detail over the next five years, and I hope we have more information about that. I was going to just say something about the effect of glomerulonephritis in response to cholesterol-containing diets, but Dr. Bullock touched upon that, and I'll just move right on past that. One of the other major contributions that squirrel monkeys have made to atherosclerosis knowledge is an experiment that Max Lang did when he was a, a fellow at our place on psychosocial stress and atherosclerosis. It's interesting indeed, I think, that as much as has been written about 
behavioral types and psychological influences on coronary heart disease uh, from an epidemiological point of view and from a, a clinical um, uh, old wise tale point of view, there's very little in the way of definitive experimental data. Uh, interestingly enough, at this point in time, this published paper is the only controlled experiment in non-human primates that was directed toward evaluating some behavioral effect on atherogenesis. It uh, was not a large experiment. Uh, it was not done in a very extensive way, but it is the only published experiment at this particular time. <laughs> we hope that will be corrected shortly because large numbers of experiments are underway at our center. But at any rate, uh, our, our stimulus to do this study was that we observed uh, a marked effect on the serum cholesterol concentrations of squirrel monkeys when they were relocated from Leticia to Winston-Salem. We did a clever little experiment which was published. Uh, we noticed that squirrel monkeys in Leticia had serum cholesterol concentrations of about 100. But squirrel monkeys, when they arrived in Winston-Salem, had a serum cholesterol of about 200. So we asked, how in the world could this be? And we planned this little study so that we followed the serum cholesterol concentrations uh, from the time they went into the trap till they went in the hole in the compound and, and on the airplane and arrival in the US and all of this sort of thing. Some of you probably know Bud Middleton. And, and that experiment that I'm just describing was Bud Middleton's entry into science. Uh, I guess that's why he wound up in Columbia, Missouri as a pig doctor instead of a monkey doctor. That's <laughs> <laughs> a little hazardous to him. <clears throat> but at any rate, uh, <clears throat> they were, were 100 in Leticia, just as we thought, and, and they went up steadily until they uh, arrived in Winston-Salem from 100 to 200, uh, a big increase while they were transported on Avianca Airlines. And I'm sure mine goes up 100 milligrams per deciliter when I ride on Avianca Airlines as well. But it was this, uh, it was this situational related increase in plasma cholesterol concentrations that first suggested to us they might be useful as behavioral models. And I, I continue to think that. But Max planned this experiment so that he had three groups of animals. He had a group, uh, the, the cage control group, or a group of animals uh, that simply uh, stayed home in their cage all day and had nothing to worry about. The, uh, in contrast, he had a group that's called a psychic stress group here that were taken out of their cages and they went into this little mock office and were put in a restraining chair and they had to make decisions to avoid a shock to their tail. And Max, being the kind of person he is, uh, had programmed it so that 15% of the time, they got a shock to their tail, even if they made the right decision. <laughs> In more recent uh, years, uh, we've come to uh, call these the department chairman group because we <laughs> thought there were some number of things in common with that. Then the Vox control group was a, was a clever one, too. And these were animals that were taken out of their cage, and they went to this little mock office, and they sat in this little restraining chair, but they had to make no decisions all day and receive no punishment or, or anything of that nature. Uh, we now call these the dean group or the, <laughs> <laughs> or the commanding officer group. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, we studied the serum cholesterol changes uh, in these animals. And you can see the serum cholesterol concentrations of the animals. Uh, when they were in their cage and after their period of being in whatever it was they did, which was decision making in this case, and there was a rather large increase in the serum cholesterol concentration, as you can see. Uh, simply staying at home all day didn't do anything to their serum cholesterol concentrations, but to go sit in the box and be restrained had a small increase in this particular group. Uh, we looked at their 17 keto steroid output as some additional evidence that the animals were in fact stressed. And as you can see, there's very little catabolic product of stress hormone coming out in the urine if the animals stayed home all day. If they were faced with stressful problems to solve, there was a rather remarkable increase in their urinary excretion of cortisol byproduct. And in fact, it was intermediate or nearly as high if uh, 
one simply was restrained in the chair. Finally, uh, we'll focus on the coronary artery atherosclerosis in these animals. They were, there were five animals in each group, and if, in the cage controls, none of the five animals had any coronary atherosclerosis. In the case of the, the psychic stress group, all of the animals, five of the five, had coronary disease. In the case of the box control groups, four of the five did. And I guess the moral to that story, in addition to showing the usefulness of squirrel monkeys and this kind of research is that if you have to go into work, you may as well go ahead and make some painful decisions because you're going to be just as much at risk to coronary disease anyway. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll move on now to rhesus monkeys, and, and I should say that I'm only going to comment on three kinds of models of atherosclerosis uh, because one can have a several-day lecture on non-human primate models of atherosclerosis nowadays because it has become such a large research activity and because so much is known. But uh, I didn't think you all would want to stay for another uh, day or two and hear about monkey models of atherosclerosis. So I tried to be selective and to choose the three that probably are of most interest and most studied by most people. And that would be squirrel monkeys uh, uh, and rhesus monkeys and cinnamalgus macaques. And those are the three that I'm going to talk about. Well, that, that is a, a handsome rhesus monkey for those of you who don't know rhesus monkeys at sight. And they are the animals that have been studied most extensively in atherosclerosis research. Uh, the early work of Bruce Taylor and his colleagues in Chicago in the late 1940s and early 1950s were the ones who really stimulated the interest in rhesus monkeys as models. Uh, there have been an extensive number of investigators who contributed a great deal to our understanding of rhesus monkey models uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, I, I would like to comment only on a few aspects of rhesus monkeys uh, and their atherosclerosis. Beginning first with some comments about their coronary artery disease. First of all, their coronary arteries are very epicardially distributed, as you can see in this photograph and one can tell from the gross appearance about how effective they are with the coronary atherosclerosis. As you can see in this photograph, this animal is extensively affected, and the whole, all of the coronary arteries as viewed from their epicardial surface are ropey in their appearance, and one can almost see the large plaques as you look through the adventitial surface in these arteries. Uh, the rates of myocardial infarction in rhesus monkeys in association with their coronary artery atherosclerosis resembles the frequency in human beings very remarkably. And I think there's an interesting lesson in modeling there because for a lot of years people said, well, rhesus monkeys are different from people in that they do not get myocardial infarctions in association with their coronary artery disease. Uh, that was simply a sampling problem because the rate in high-risk human beings is one per 300 per year. Now, since the human primate colony is so large in any particular city, when you have a disease that will affect one per 300 per year, then you get the impression that it's quite a common disorder. But if you start to model something with that same frequency, that means then you have to have a large colony to see one per year. And it was really not until we had 300 monkeys at risk to coronary disease that we began to see about one per year, and that's about how many we saw. And it looks like the heart attack rate in rhesus monkeys is about exactly that in man, or one per 300 at risk per year. But the characteristics are very much like that of, of human atherosclerosis. This is a, a rather poor photograph since it's a rather poor photograph, I won't tell you which one of our various postdoctoral fellows took the photograph, <laughs> but you can see the affected coronary artery up here, and you can see recent and old uh, necrosis in this heart. Uh, on cross-section, you can see the affected coronary artery here, and you can see some old fibrosis and some fresh necrosis that's going on. When one looks at the affected coronary artery, uh, you can see that the lumen is virtually occluded here, it is, this is the whole coronary artery. There's some necrosis, mineralization, and all, no residual lumen to speak of there. 
Now, one of the things that has interested us most and one of the current uh, uses that we're trying to make out of the rhesus monkey model is to sort out some of the questions of individuality and coronary artery atherosclerosis susceptibility and resistance that I mentioned earlier. That is, among individuals with the same general level of risk factor exposure, what accounts for differences in more or less coronary artery atherosclerosis? And I think this is one of the really profound questions for the comparative pathologist these days because I'm increasingly struck by the number of human beings that we see at autopsy with extensive coronary artery disease, but that are not hypertensive and they are not hyperlipidemic and there are none of the traditional risk factors that will explain their extensive coronary disease. In fact, some people like to quote uh, uh, an estimate that I think is a little too high, and that is that you can't explain on the basis of traditional risk factors the extensive coronary disease in 80% of such subjects. I, I think that's probably a little high. But at any rate, uh, we are, we're, we're making a lot of effort in trying to model this system now, and we hope we stimulate other people to try to model it. <coughs> One might ask, well, why do we start with rhesus monkeys? <laughs> There's nothing, no magical reason for that, except that we had a very large number around. We did an experiment with about 300 male monkeys, and so we had a, a large population to study, and that's why we did it. Our approach to the problem was a simple one. After, after about two years of, of wasted time with our cardiologic colleagues and trying to do stress electrocardiograms and trying to do coronary angiography and other things, we asked ourselves one day, well, why not be bold? Why mess around with these various non-invasive non approaches if, in fact, one of the advantages to studying monkeys is that you can be as invasive as you wish? So our diagnostic uh, approach uh, was a rather harsh one. We opened their chest and opened their pericardium and looked at their coronary arteries and felt of them and photographed them. And this is an animal uh, seen at the time of surgery. It's one that we have scored as rather extensive in terms of their coronary artery atherosclerosis. You can see the coronary arteries here. They're large, they're ropey in their appearance, and we would call this an extensively affected monkey. In contrast, uh, here's a monkey with, with little or no coronary artery atherosclerosis. In contrast with this, oh, I meant to go backwards. In contrast, the first one we saw with a lot of atherosclerosis. Well, our approach uh, now has been to take these male monkeys uh, whose plasma lipids and blood pressures were all essentially the same but that had very discordant amounts of coronary artery atherosclerosis and to establish them into breeding groups and produce progeny to determine if the trait is a parenterally determined trait or if, or if it's in fact not under genetic control. But our very strong bias was that it was a polygenically controlled phenomena. Naturally, this is about a 15-year experiment in order to get any really valid data, and we're very much in the middle of it now, being seven years uh, at this point into the study. We're quite hampered in one of our approaches because rhesus monkey females in a breeding colony situation seem to have almost complete protection against diet-induced coronary artery atherosclerosis. So we've not been able to use our thoracotomy technique to determine how much coronary disease our females had, and we've had to uh, move into a very complicated way of assessing what their genetic contribution is to their progeny since they have the female protection that prevents them from phenotypically expressing their own genetic information. Well, we, uh, we've done this now by uh, doing thoracotomies on all of our male progeny that are three years of age and trying knowing the coronary artery status of our fathers in this particular experiment, then we assign a hypothetical no number to the females. And we, it's a hypothesis at this moment, but we are testing it. We have established that among juvenile monkeys at three years of age, we can discern their coronary disease by thoracotomy. Here's an example of a three-year-old juvenile 
produced by one of these matings, and you can see the plaques in this coronary artery right here. In contrast to this animal here who has no coronary artery atherosclerosis, of course, these individuals uh, were maintained under the same conditions of diet. So we think it seems to be working. We think our thoracotomy technique is working because this is a histological section from the animal that I showed you where I said he had plaques, and we can show histologically that he does have plaques. The animals we thought were normal were in fact normal, and we were indeed encouraged that if one compares our thoracotomy grade with a carefully derived morphometric measurement of their coronary disease, there's about a 0.8 correlation. Uh, Dr. Bullock and I grade these at the operating table independently so we can compare our individual correlations with histologic findings, and I can tell you we were exactly the same. I was hoping statistically one or the other of us would do it better than the other one, but we did it equally well. Well, so, no, so much about individuality. Just a few words about the use of, of rhesus monkeys in studies on atherosclerosis regression. That has been a, a large activity that has consumed a lot of effort uh, uh, in a number of research centers over the past 10 years because there is a lot of interest and concern about the extent to which at least coronary atherosclerotic plaques are regressible. Well, we, uh, we have been uh, involved in this research, uh, as has the University of Iowa and the University of Chicago in a rather major way. The design of our experiment uh, was a complicated one. Uh, it was one in which we had two colonies of rhesus monkeys, one with short-term diet-induced atherosclerosis for 19 months and another with more long-term induced atherosclerosis, uh, inducing it for twice as long, or 38 months. Whether they were fed for 19 or 38 months, uh, we took out a baseline group called an A group in each place that was carefully selected statistically to be representative of the population. And it was supposed to tell us how bad the atherosclerosis was at the time the dietary interventions began. Then what we did was to have what was called a B group and a C group. The B groups were maintained at plasma cholesterol concentrations that we believed would were bad for human beings. And that was between 280 and 320 milligrams per deciliter. We chose that as modeling what's bad for human beings. The C groups we chose to model what we think is good for human beings, and that's to be between 180 and 220 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, this is an example of a, of a frozen section stained for fat from one of the animals from the A group after 19 months of, of diet induction. This is from a B group with a bad, bad serum cholesterol concentration after two years of quotes regression. And you can see that it tends to look a little worse. And this is from one of the C group animals uh, that had the good cholesterol concentration. And one gets the impression that it tends to look a little better. Well, what we in fact determined in this experiment was that when one looks for small differences like one might expect to see in an experiment of this nature, that the routine sort of pathologic procedures that had been used in the past to evaluate coronary artery atherosclerosis were, were not sufficient. That is, people had called coronary disease slight, moderate, or severe, or they graded it one, two, three, four, or whatever. But uh, with Dr. Bond's enthusiasm for morphometry and with Dr. Bullock's enthusiasm for morphometry, we went on over to a system in where actual areas of a lesion are measured with a handheld digitizer from a projected slide and with an interface computer, we actually measure the areas within each of the parts of the artery. For example, by going around this artery with the digitizer, around the internal elastic membrane, and then going around its, its luminal surface, one can then record an area of the plaque, which would be called the intimal area. And in the one slide I'm going to show you from this experiment, uh, the data presented are changes in intimal area, which would be the actual amounts of, of plaque in these particular animals. The top half of the slide is after two years of observation, 
<coughs> the bottom half of the slide is after four years of observation in being either at a bad or a good serum cholesterol concentration. Well, as you can see, after two years of being at a bad serum cholesterol concentration, the coronary disease got a little worse. I guess that didn't surprise anybody. And the good serum cholesterol concentrations, however, uh, we saw in, in these data are divided in terms of the severities as expressed by three subdivisions of the rank order of the data. Among the most severely affected animals in that group, there was really no change from baseline. And of course, these animals had little or no atherosclerosis anyway, so they didn't change much from baseline. So most of the regression that occurred was in the middle of the distribution of severities, or the, or the ones with a medium amount of atherosclerosis. We thought that was interesting. And when we looked four years later, we again saw little change, or no really no significant change from baseline among the animals at a bad serum cholesterol concentration. But among those with a good, we saw no further change in the ones with a medium amount of atherosclerosis. But encouragingly, after two years of additional time, the ones with the most extensive atherosclerosis had, in fact, regressed considerably. Now, rhesus monkeys probably are reasonably good models for regression. One of the difficulties that we've observed is that their coronary arteries get larger as their plaques progress, and the interpretation of some of these morphometric data are very difficult. Uh, this is probably true of, of most macaques, and I think it's probably too early to for us to conclude which of the primate models uh, uh, do not have a complication of increasing size with increasing severity of atherosclerosis. Well, to move on now to Cinemalgus macaques, uh, uh, with the lack of creativity that most animal modelers uh, have, I expect uh, we never would have become involved, we speaking not of ourselves, but atherosclerosis researchers in general would not likely have become involved with Cinemalgus macaques in a major way mm -hmm. if it had not been for the rhesus monkey shortage and people looking for a substitute for rhesus monkeys. In fact, it turned out to be a very fortuitous thing because I believe that Cinemalgus macaques are superior to rhesus monkeys in every way as models for atherosclerosis research. So it's been very fortunate that, that the field was forced into the widespread use of Cinemalgus macaques, or else they would have stayed with, with rhesus monkeys and never have enjoyed some of the lovely characteristics of Cinemalgus monkeys. Well, this, uh, this is one of our, our smiling Cinemalgus monkeys at, at our particular center. Uh, earlier on, we've looked at some racial differences in their atherosclerosis characteristic, and they do have racial differences. We find that the animals from Malaysia are more affected than are the animals from the Philippine Islands. We find that myocardial infarction seems to be much more common in Cinemalgus monkeys than rhesus monkeys, and that myocardial infarction is more, much more common among Malaysian than Philippine animals. In fact, all the infarctions we've ever seen have been animals from Malaysia, none ever from animals from the Philippine Islands. There are differences in their lesion characteristics, uh, which Dr. Wagner and I have uh, described in the literature, and there will shortly be another publication by Dr. Bond and some of his associates that will point out even other differences in the lesion characteristics between Philippine and Malayan animals. So from the standpoint of studying racial differences, I think that's a very strong advantage. And as I pointed out earlier in the day, racial differences are very important in human beings. So I think that's an important characteristic. The animals uh, do share with Caucasian North American females and females of other societies a male-female difference. And I'm going to comment on that uh, rather briefly because up until the time the work was done at our center, uh, principally by Dr. Ham and Dr. Bullock, there were no known models of, quotes, female protection of human beings. Now, female protection, and when I use that term, I mean the relative sparing of the coronary arteries of females uh, in the development of coronary atherosclerosis. Uh, 
varies a great deal from society to society and from race to race. Uh, the extremes uh, would be uh, in La Plata, Argentina, for example, the males are about seven times as affected as the females. There are other populations, several populations in Scandinavia in which there are no male-female differences. And among North American blacks, there are no male-female differences. Caucasian North Americans are intermediate, and the males are about four times as affected as the females. So we, we set out to try to, to model this, uh, this disorder, and the first ones that were looked at were by ham and bullock, and we chose Cinemalgus monkeys for, uh, for some very good reasons. And you can see the differences in the coronary disease. Uh, there, it's about three times. Uh, the, the differential is about three times. So they're, they're very close to Caucasian North Americans. We have extended this search in, in over the, since that time to look for other extremes, thinking within a, a genus as broad as Macaca, we should be able to find species that would represent all these variations. And we think we have, I've mentioned earlier that that rhesus monkeys have, females have almost complete female protection, and they're like the ladies in La Plata, Argentina. <laughs> I don't know if the ladies in La Plata, Argentina know they're like rhesus monkeys, but <laughs> they are at any rate. And the stump-tailed macaques, uh, females, surprisingly to us, have no measurable female protection. That is, the females within our breeding colony are as severely affected with atherosclerosis as their male counterparts, and in that way, they would be uh, like black Americans and some people in Scandinavia. Well, our group has tried to look at some of the mechanisms that account for these male-female differences in Cinemalgus macaques. Uh, we think we know some of them. And these are, these are increases in the size of lipoprotein, the low-density lipoprotein particles as serum cholesterol concentrations go up. It was our impression that males had a continuous increase in their LDL sizes, while females got to about 4.5 Daltons and simply didn't increase thereafter. And looking at this statistically, we found there was a very high correlation between LDL size and the severity of coronary disease in males and females, and that has continued to be a, a big interest at our center and at, at many other centers. Well, in the, in the time that I have, uh, I want to say a few words about uh, vasectomy and atherosclerosis, and I have included that with the Cinemalgus monkeys because our first experiments uh, were with Cinemalgus monkeys and all of our continuing experiments into the question of relationships between vasectomy and atherosclerosis are continuing uh, in Cinemalgus monkeys. I, I think that I probably should pause and give you just a little background about why one would ever think there might be a relationship between vasectomy and, and coronary artery atherosclerosis because it is a long way from the scrotum to the heart. <laughs> well, it, uh, our, our interest in, in the question derives uh, from two pieces of emerging evidence over recent years. The first of these were by many Kenny's co-workers at the Cornell Medical School who showed that the repeated injection of a foreign antigen and they used horse serum worsened atherosclerosis in rabbits. Uh, Minnick and old George Murphy and that group started off trying to produce the Ashoff bodies associated with rheumatic fever. That was really their objective. And, uh, someone was, and I were talking in the hall about serendipity earlier on. They really were not into the atherosclerosis business at that particular time, but they were rheumatic fever doctors, and they thought this repeated exposure of this foreign antigen would surely produce the ash off bodies of, of rheumatic fever. Well, it didn't, uh, but when they looked at their arteries, they found this worsened atherosclerosis, and so they decided to get, forget about being a rheumatic fever doctor and take up being atherosclerosis doctors, and they've been extremely successful at it. But others have confirmed their observation and shown that the repeated injections of things like bovine serum albumin uh, all worsen atherosclerosis. And the presumed pathogenetic mechanism is that the antigen antibody complexes that occur when an immunized animal continues to be given antigen uh, 
that these immune complexes damage the vascular endothelium and that with injury to the vascular endothelium there is an accumulation of platelets on that focus of injured, injured endothelium and that these platelets release platelet growth factors and other substances that cause lesions to develop more rapidly and that the artery becomes more permeable to the plasma macromolecules and the lipoproteins come marching in and the whole sequence of events for progressive atherosclerosis. That is the presumed uh, mechanism. Well, over the same course of time, uh, the group at the Oregon Primate Center, uh, primarily Nancy Alexander and her colleagues, had been studying the immune responses to vasectomy, uh, being all the way across the country and the pieces of evidence never quite coming together. But uh, the findings were that among vasectomized monkeys and men and other animals, that there were almost invariably anti-sperm antibodies that occurred in the plasma following vasectomy. Here again, the presumed mechanism is that, that the testis is a unique organism and that it continues to produce sperm at the same rate across time after its afferent duct is ligated. That much is known, so daily sperm production continues at the same rate as it ever went on after the vas deferens is ligated. And that lack in a normal anatomical passage of these sperm are are degraded to some extent in the vas deferens and, and both directly and by macrophage invasion into the vas deferens do enter the circulation as a variety of different kinds of sperm antigens. And it being a very foreign protein, antibodies form against this antigen and the antigen continues to enter the circulation. So just like a daily injection of bovine serum albumin one has a daily injection of sperm antigen. And it's a constant infusion pump and we carry it around and protect it from cold and injury and all of that sort of thing. It's a very unique sort of a little biological system. Well, based on that evidence, we, uh, we concluded that for every reason that we could imagine, vasectomy should do the same thing to atherosclerosis that daily injections of horse serum or bovine serum albumin did. So we conducted the first experiment with cinnamogus monkeys, and that brings me back now to cinnamogus monkeys, and the data you see are for sham vasectomized animals and vasectomized animals that were fed the same diet for the same length of time. The diet was one that was rich in cholesterol that contained a milligram per kilocalorie of cholesterol. Their plasma cholesterol concentrations were exactly the same between the two groups. The vasectomized animals made a typical immune response to their vasectomy, and of course the sham vasectomized animals did not. When we examined their arteries, uh, as you can see from the data, the vasectomized animals were remarkably, uh, had remarkably more atherosclerosis than did their sham vasectomized counterparts, uh, being very striking in the carotid artery, as you can see, being striking in the carotid bifurcation, being not very impressive in the thoracic aorta, but very impressive in the abdominal aorta, where the vasectomized animals had about 92% of their surface involved with plaques, while it was only 28% involved in the sham vasectomized animals, and it was true in the other arterial sites that we studied. Uh, one of the most striking, let me just back up again and point out that in the cerebral arteries, the numbers you see are their number of grossly visible plaques in the base of the brain. And we were intrigued by these because to find plaques in the base of the brain of monkeys simply fed an atherogenic diet is, is very infrequent. One does see it when hypertension is superimposed upon an atherogenic diet, but these animals were not hypertensive. So we were rather struck by really a, a rather large difference in the number of plaques in the base of the brain. And they were photogenically very beautiful. These are, I'm going to show you two examples of the base of the brain from vasectomized cinnamogus macaques. Here you can see the large uh, plaques uh, at the confluence of the vertebral arteries into the base of the artery. And this is one of my actually favorite photographs. You can see the vertebral arteries come into confluence to form the base of the artery and a, a plaque which almost completely constricts the lumen of the artery here in the base of the artery. Uh, 
So immunologic events as risk factors for cerebral artery atherosclerosis, I think will continue to be really very important. Uh, just in, in closing, we've done a longer term study uh, with rhesus monkeys. One of, the, one of the concerns that we and others had about the Cinemalgus uh, study on vasectomy was whether one had to have a very cholesterol rich diet and thus very high cholesterol concentrations in order to see the effect of, of vasectomy on atherogenesis. Well, at the Oregon Primate Center, they had some old rhesus monkeys that had been around a long time uh, that had had vasectomies for nine to 14 years, and they had age match controls for them. These animals had always eaten monkey chow, which is devoid of cholesterol, very <coughs> low in fat, and very high in fiber, and they had plasma cholesterol concentrations of around 120 milligrams per deciliter, about 100 milligrams per deciliter, of which was HDL cholesterol. So they had the most favorable kind of plasma lipid concentrations you could hope for in the most favorable dietary history, and they only differed by having had a vasectomy for 9 to 14 years in their age match controls. Well, we had an opportunity to examine these animals and uh, or at least some of the arteries from the animals. We unfortunately did not get hearts and brains from them. But as you can see, the extent of atherosclerosis uh, uh, is greater among the animals with long-term vasectomies, even if they eat a diet that's devoid of cholesterol. It's particularly striking in the abdominal aorta, as it was in the case of the cinnamalgus macaques, of the difference in being highly significant about 35% versus 5% of the surface of the arteries involved with plaques. Uh, in the arteries of the legs, uh, there were about three times as much atherosclerosis in the arteries of the legs among the long-term vasectomized animals as among their sham, I mean their age match controls. Uh, we ask ourselves about their circulating free antibody and about half of the animals were negative for circulating free anti-sperm antibody. So we reasoned that it would be interesting to look at the, the atherosclerosis scores based on whether they were positive or negative for circulating free anti-sperm antibody. Our reasons being if they were negative for free anti-sperm antibody, although they had once been positive, that that would suggest that they were in antigen excess and that the reason they were in antigen excess, uh, I mean, the reason they were negative for circulating free antibody is because all their antibody is tied up by the excess antigen. In contrast, those that were positive, we reasoned, for circulating free antibody would be those that had less antigenemia and uh, therefore would be positive for circulating free antibody. Stated another way, and we've gotten subsequent evidence for this now, those that are negative for free antibody would be those that would tend to be positive for circulating immune complexes. Well, at any rate, we, we divided up these vasectomized animals on the basis of whether they were positive or negative. And as you can see, there is a, a major effect of being negative for circulating free anti-sperm antibody. Uh, as you might imagine, this is one of the most common questions I get from our vasectomized friends who had their... <laughs> had their anti-sperm antibodies uh, evaluated, they say, well, what does this mean? Well, as you can see, I really don't know what it means. I, I suppose to have a high antibody titer is good based on our present evidence, and uh, to lack an antibody titer is probably bad, but what you really have to do is to measure the circulating immune complexes very critically, because it would be our hypothesis that these are negative or those that are high for circulating immune complexes and Dr. Tung at the University of New Mexico has confirmed this in three of these animals. Uh, finally, I'll show you an example of an abdominal aorta from one of these long-term vasectomized animals. That had, this animal had a plasma cholesterol concentration of 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, he'd had a, a vasectomy for nine years, and you can see in his abdominal aorta this raised uh, plaque that's rather extensive. Well, I think uh, Dr. Jones, that's my last slide, and I'll stop here. Yeah. I'll leave them.
Thank you. Not only is this morning North Carolina morning here in Washington, but it's going to be a heavy dose of atherosclerosis, uh, it seems. Maybe it'll keep you from eating eggs, at least for tomorrow morning, uh, with such a big dose. Perhaps I uh, should begin by just saying a few words about atherosclerosis of human beings uh, so that we all start from a common uh, base of what it is that we're trying to model. Atherosclerosis is a disease process uh, primarily of the arterial intima, but involving to some extent uh, the superficial media. It's a process that begins early in childhood, uh, certainly by the time infants are a year old, there are changes in the arterial intima. Uh, fatty streaks are quite common by five or six years of age. But shortly after puberty, fatty streaks uh, become fatty plaques, and by young adulthood, these fatty plaques become fibromuscular plaques and complications of these plaques usually occur uh, sometime around midlife uh, to later life, uh, depending on the risk factor exposure of the people and their genetic background. Now, as I think all of you realize, uh, there's great variation in the extent and severity of atherosclerotic complications among different uh, societies and uh, races and also among different individuals within the same society. Much of our own research has been directed toward trying to understand this individual variability of why some individuals have their atherosclerosis progress at a more rapid rate than others. And I'll keep coming back to that uh, in both of my presentations. Because atherosclerosis continues to be the leading cause of both morbidity and mortality in our country, there's been a very large research effort over the past 20 or 30 years uh, in all aspects of the basic mechanisms in atherogenesis. The field at first was hampered by the lack of sufficient numbers of good animal models for high quality research, at least into the early 1960s. We now have so many different animal models that may be hampered by the complexity of so many models and the complexity of interpreting data that comes from so many different kinds of reactions. But I think we'll begin uh, with the pigeon story. Do I do anything to start? It just happens. Huh? The first button. There. This is a white carnot pigeon. and. Uh, it's an attractive and kindly bird, and it's a good thing because it's taken up uh, nearly 25 years of my life. Uh, in about 1958, we were fortunate, just absolutely fortunate, in finding the naturally occurring atherosclerosis in these birds, and rather that you would think it was a carefully planned experiment that came to uh, the end with the identification of the atherosclerosis in these birds, I'll have to tell you a little bit about how it came to be. Earlier, we'd worked with cholesterol fat-fed chickens, and we were interested in exercise and the effects of exercise uh, on the atherosclerotic process. And one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Pritchard, who some of you know, was a pigeon fancier, and he suggested, well, we should get pigeons because they would be easy to exercise. You could simply let them out of the loft each morning and let them fly around, and we'd have this real fine natural experiment uh, on exercise. So we said, well, what kind of pigeons should we use? And being a pigeon fancier that he was, uh, he referred us to this unusual uh, group of birds, these white carno. And I say unusual because they all arose from four pair of birds that were brought to this country in 1917. Uh, Mr. Wendell Levi, who was the founder of the Palmetto Pigeon Plant, took a real fancy to the birds at a pigeon show in Paris and uh, bought these four pair and brought them back to Sumter with him. And he derived from that original four pair a population of about 50,000 at the time that we began to study them in the late 1950s. So Professor Pritchard and I decided that would be a unique, nice, homogeneous uh, population of birds. And we got our exercise studies underway. Uh, 
and decided that we should acquire some old birds uh, of that breed to, to do necropsies on them to show that they did not have naturally occurring atherosclerosis just to make our design nice and tidy. So we did get about 20 pigeons and uh, necropsied them uh, to show that they didn't. Only all of them did, and that started a, a line of research. It's been ongoing at our institution now for a little more than 20 years and in several institutions around the world. Uh, the white carno pigeons uh, have been kept as a pure strain only at our institution because in 1956 they introduced some strange genes, some white kings and some other breeds into the palmetto stock. So the only uh, genetic uh, strain of pure white carno pigeons has been maintained at, at our institution. Now this is a picture of a show racer pigeon. We thought that if we were to do productive research, uh, we needed an atherosclerosis resistant pigeon, and we chose uh, the show racer as a, an example of an atherosclerosis resistant pigeon because they were resistant in the aorta. And this slide is an old one that goes way back, uh, comparing four breeds of pigeons to, in terms of their response to a cholesterol containing diet. We, uh, let's see how to, there we go. These were racing homers and these were show racers and these were silver kings and were, these were the white Carnot, which were the ones that we had uh, anticipated using first of all. As you can see that, that both the racing homers and the show racers are relatively resistant to atherosclerosis, having almost none in their aorta. And silver kings and white Carnot were equally susceptible either by gross grading for lesions or by the amount of aorta cholesterol that was present. Well, with these susceptibilities and resistance, uh, we chose the show racers because a relatively good strain of the birds were available from the palmetto pigeon plant and, uh, and the white carno uh, pigeons for the reasons that I had indicated. Now, the atherosclerosis resistance of show racers is something that needs clarification because you'll often see references in the literature to the atherosclerosis resistant show racer. And in terms of resistance to an atherogenic or cholesterol containing diet, that resistance is only present in the aorta. In fact, the coronary arteries of show racer pigeons are somewhat more susceptible to diet induced atherosclerosis than are the coronary arteries of the white carnal pigeons. This is a very often overlooked phenomenon and it suggests that the resistance in the show racer has something to do with local factors that are going on uh, in the aorta at the point of the bifurcation of the celiac artery. Whether these are hemodynamic or whether they are some genetic control to uh, focus directly at that site or a combination of these, uh, we aren't quite sure but at least that resistance is not shared with the coronary arteries. Now we'll take a few minutes to talk about the pathologic characteristics of the naturally occurring atherosclerosis in white carnal pigeons. This is an aorta which has been opened longitudinally. This is the bifurcation into the celiac artery and the short abdominal aorta. It is the site in which the lesions almost invariably occur. And that's one of the advantages of the naturally occurring atherosclerosis of white carnos as a model system. Because with a high degree of predictability, the naturally occurring plaques will be at this site. This is a, a bird that's about five or six years old. You can see the plaques are yellow in appearance. They're, they're raised. Uh, the carotenoid in the plasma stains them a nice brilliant yellow color. It makes them quite artistically beautiful. This is another aorta uh, from a white carno pigeon with the naturally occurring atherosclerosis, and it shows several complications. Now, in our experience, uh, we see more complications of plaques of pigeons than we do of any of the other animal models. In fact, it's interesting. The, the lesions of pigeons in all of their aspects, in terms of their pathogenesis, in terms of their histologic characteristics, and the ways and the types of complications that their lesions undergo uh, 
are much more like those of human beings than any other animals we've ever studied. But for some strange reason, as science has evolved, uh, if we make an observation in pigeons, then our colleagues in atherosclerosis research always ask first off, well, when are you going to try it in monkeys? It's very fashionable to try things in monkeys, and one believes that the results are more definitive and more readily applicable to human beings. But in fact, the, pig the pigeon lesions continue to be much more like those of human beings than any of the other animal models we've studied. This particular slide is a, is a nice one to point out some of these complications. You can see a, a plaque here at this branch point in this artery, this aorta, and there is a, a mural thrombus superimposed on its surface. You can see the, uh, the thrombus at this point. Now this is a, a plaque with a, a crater in the middle. When you section a plaque like that, this, the edges of this crater are usually mineralized. Our interpretation of these craters, since we've seen them in all sorts of stages, is that they represent a healed ulcer, where a atherosclerotic plaque has ulcerated and probably had a superimposed mural thrombus at that point in time, like the thrombus we see here. When it has healed, it leaves a crater-like sort of a lesion. The whole question of the factors which cause plaques to ulcerate and become involved with mural thrombi are not in any way understood. And these pigeons represent really the only reasonable model for conducting studies on interventions with such things as plaque ulceration and in, are the complications of mural thrombosis. Because at any particular time, if you examine a sufficient number of birds of five to six years of age, you'll find about five or six percent of them will have mural thrombi. So one could then detect either an increase or a decrease in such plaque complications as a result of a nutritional intervention or a drug intervention. And it represents the only model system I know of to do that. Now this is a frozen section stained with hematoxin and eosin to point out some of the characteristics of the naturally occurring plaques and pigeons. Uh, this, the, the lumen is on this side. This is the adventitia. You can see that there is a fibromuscular cap that separates the lipid containing portion of the lesion from the lumen. Within the uh, plaque, there is finely distributed intracellular lipid, there is extracellular lipid, and there are foci of mineralization. And in the adventitia, there is an adventitial reaction and accumulation of some lymphocytes, which are rather consistent with lesions of some complexity. This is a hematoxin and eosin stain section of a typical pigeon plaque uh, that looks like a typical plaque of a human being or, or primates that have atherosclerosis that look like those of human beings. Here we have the lipid containing or, or gruel portion of the plaque, and this is a fibromuscular cap. Now, in, among plaque scholars, <laughs> there is a lot of discussion and controversy over what constitutes uh, a lesion in an experimental animal that does in fact resemble that of human beings. And the, the characteristics that a plaque must have, and, and most people's view, is some necrosis with accumulation of, of extracellular lipid in its base and the fibromuscular cap. And why I dwell on the fibromuscular cap as being important in a comparative way with the lesions of human beings is this. As, as a result of the geographic pathology studies that Henry McGill and his colleagues did a few years ago, we now know that the, the correlations with ischemic heart disease and coronary heart, myocardial infarction are only with plaques with fibromuscular caps of this nature. The ones that are purely fatty plaques and have foam cells with no fibromuscular cap are 
or fibrous plaques, as they are referred to in the epidemiological literature, are not associated with an increased frequency of myocardial infar infarction in a particular population. And that probably has to do with the complications of the plaque, plaque ulceration and mural thrombosis and those sort of things. They seem not to occur in purely fatty plaques, but they seem to occur in plaques with fibromuscular caps. Mineralization is a, is a characteristic that's quite common in, in pigeons. Here is a H&E section with the lumen up here. We see the fibromuscular cap, the gruel with a lot of the cholesterol crystal clefts and a small amount of mineralization in the base. Now this mineralization can be either small as one sees here or it can be very extensive as one sees in the base of this particular plaque with this lamella of mineralization. This is an example of both the extensiveness of lipid clefts and the adventitial reaction that one often sees with the extensive accumulation of lipid clefts. Pigeon plaques become vascularized in their base and vascularization uh, is in, an important characteristic of lesion complication because there can be hemorrhage in the base of a plaque and that can be one of the mechanisms by which the plaque then does suddenly occlude the lumen of the artery that it affects. Now the vascularization that one sees in the base of this pigeon plaque is an, an unusual sort. These are small arterioles in the base. These are very rare to see in human beings and in fact are not that common as a kind of vascularization in pigeon plaques. In the next slide we see the kind of vascularization that is much more common and it's just a capillary. You can see an endothelialized space in the base of this plaque. These small capillaries uh, probably grow in from the adventitial circulation, although there's a lot of controversy about where they come from. No doubt some come from the lumen of the vessel, but I believe most of them are grows from adventitial circulation. <coughs> this is an example of, of an ulcerating or an ulcerated plaque from a pigeon. We saw a gross photograph a little earlier of a plaque with a with a mural thrombus on its surface. If you were to section a lesion that looked that way in the gross, this is about how it would look in the microscopic. And I will orient you now. This is the endothelial surface, the intimal surface of the, of the artery, and this is the adventitial side of this artery. This is the media, and somewhere along here is about where the internal elastic lamina goes. So this is the substance of the intimal plaque. And as you can see, there are, there are cholesterol clefts in the base of this plaque, a lot of active necrosis going on. And associated with this necrotic area of the plaque is this very thick mural thrombus on its surface. And inevitably, when one sees a plaque that is ulcerating and does have a mural thrombus, we see a thick accumulation of uh, leukocytes in the adventitia. Now, there has been interest among the experimental pathologists in, for a long time about the role of these adventitial lymphocytes uh, in plaque ulceration. Sort of a which comes first, the hen or the egg question, whether ulceration, the necrosis began and attracts the lymphocytes, or whether this could be some sort of an autoimmune reaction, and that there are processes that go on within the plaque that are antigenic, and that stimulates the organism to form antibodies and these lymphocytes are bringing antibodies and are actually the cause of the necrosis instead of a secondary association. If one was clever enough some way, one could probably use pigeons to sort out some of those kinds of questions. Well now, uh, to turn to a moment, for a moment, to the question of when does atherosclerosis begin in pigeons? Uh, that was a fun uh, thing to unscramble, too, because we'd look mostly at, at adult birds around five or six years of age, and perhaps I should tell you that many pigeons live to be 20 years of age. To be 13, 14, or 15 is not uncommon at all for 
pigeons. Uh, the median lifespan in our own colony was about 16 years of age. So uh, when you're dealing with a five or six year old bird, one's dealing with a relatively young kind of a pigeon. Well, our first guess uh, of where to look for the beginnings of atherosclerosis were to look at birds two or three years of age and we kept working back. Uh, this was a point in time before we knew very much about the early origins of human atherosclerosis and that one did see it in childhood. Well, in fact, one sees it in childhood in pigeons. <laughs> you hear a lot of in, in discussion in human atherosclerosis about childhood atherosclerosis. Well, we certainly have a lot of childhood atherosclerosis in, in pigeons. And I'll tell you a little bit about its origins. Uh, um, this was a, a slide that summarizes some of those observations where we started looking at, at months two, six, seven and a half, and 12, and measuring the percent of the intimal surface uh, that had uh, gross plaques. And as you can see, you don't see any grossly visible plaques until they're somewhere between uh, seven months and a, and a year of age. Well, we thought, well, given that, uh, the appearance of a grossly visible plaque uh, by seven and a half to 12 months of age, when do they begin at the histological level? Well, we started looking at, at young birds, and I thought maybe I'd review uh, how fast young pigeons grow because it's an unusual part of uh, pigeons as models. First of all, uh, pigeons are hatched out and uh, they're very infantile. Uh, unlike baby chickens or, or baby turkeys that are fairly well developed at the time they hatch out and are able to feed themselves, uh, pigeons are very infantile. This is a one week old bird. Uh, when they're first hatched, they're unable really to hold their heads up and both their mothers and their fathers have to participate in their feeding since they're unable to feed themselves. I guess, uh, I guess pigeons were the first ones to ever hear of women's liberation because the male pigeon spends as much time nursing the infant as does the female of the species. In fact, it's on a rigorous schedule. Uh, there are certain hours of the morning that the male actually either sits on eggs or is involved in the nursing of the infant and other hours that the female does so and this is rigorously clocked and uh, doesn't vary but more than a few minutes in each part of the day. Well, the baby pigeon is fed what's called pigeon milk, which is really desquamated uh, epithelial lining cells of the crop, which under the stimulus of prolactin, which comes mostly from the pituitary's signal from the brain when they hear the, the baby pigeon squeak, causes these cells to proliferate. They're regurgitated and forced down the mouth of, of the baby pigeon. Kind of an unwholesome sounding uh, process. <laughs> it is the way pigeons are fed. Well, in, in order to appreciate the early complexity of pigeon atherosclerosis, you have to know that this pigeon milk, as it's called, is very rich in fat. It's, uh, there are lipid-filled cells that are desquamated, and the material contains almost three-tenths of a milligram per kilocalorie of cholesterol. Uh, so when one tells the story about pigeons developing atherosclerosis without ever having eat eaten any dietary cholesterol, <laughs> it really is a, only a half-truth. Uh, it's a truth in the sense that they didn't eat it, but it's not a truth in the sense that their mothers and fathers did cram some cholesterol down their throats in their early life. Uh, so it, they d did get quite a lot of cholesterol. Their serum cholesterol concentrations in early life are interesting. First of all, pigeons tend to have rather high serum cholesterol concentrations anyway. Uh, they do vary seasonably, but in the fall of the year, a normal pigeon serum cholesterol would be something around 280 milligrams per deciliter reaching a high of something like 350 or 400 milligrams per deciliter in the spring months. Now that's without any dietary cholesterol. But when baby pigeons are born or hatched, they have serum cholesterol concentrations around seven or 800 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, 
and that's because they derive all of their nutrition from the egg yolk. Of course, baby chickens do that too. Uh, but that was a little surprising to us until we realized that they were egg yolk fed uh, infants until they hatched out. So since they are born or hatched with serum cholesterol concentrations of around 700 milligrams per deciliter, and since the mother and the father are cram more fat-rich material down their crop, they maintain high serum cholesterol concentrations until they're about five or six weeks of age. Now, that was one week old bird. They grow remarkably, and by two weeks of age, uh, they have gotten to about this stage of development. This is a three-week-old pigeon. That's a four-week-old pigeon. That's a five-week-old pigeon, and by five weeks, they've reached a body weight that will not be significantly different from their adult body weight. Now, we began looking at these, at these sites of predilection for lesion development uh, at a few days after hatching. This is, an ex this is a rather poor example, I'm afraid, but it is an example of a frozen section which was taken at the point of the celiac bifurcation. There is a bifurcation pad there, but we believe this may be one of the earliest changes that we can see at that site, and that is the proliferation of smooth muscle cells in and around the celiac bifurcation, which one begins to see, uh, uh, or one sees in birds that are three days old to a week old. So it's very early uh, in the development of the pigeon. I wouldn't be surprised if one could find them, uh, almost said in utero, I guess one should say in ego. <laughs> If one would go into the egg, since they are deriving a lot of their nutrition from the egg yolk, they're very hyperlipidemic, I expect there are demonstrable changes in egg yolk. But at any rate, uh, by the time the birds are five weeks of age, there really is a very clearly demonstrable entomal plaque. This is, a, again, a frozen section. It's been stained with Sudan 4. You can see the internal elastic membrane right here and a rather thick uh, animal plaque, which is really an increased number of smooth muscle cells, we believe, and these smooth muscle cells uh, contain a lot of fat droplets uh, within their cytoplasm, given the appearance of, of a fatty streak by five weeks. Now, to say a few words about the coronary artery atherosclerosis of pigeons, uh, it looks exactly like that which goes on in the aorta. Pigeons do not have large epicardial arteries like primates in man. They become intramyocardial very early in their distribution. And this is a typical looking coronary artery plaque. Now, myocardial infarction is the most common cause of death in pigeons if you, can, if you stratify tumors into their individual types. Of course, Tumors are the most common cause of death in old pigeons, but myocardial infarction is more common than any single kind of tumor. Professor Pritchard uh, in our institution tabulated these over the whole life history uh, uh, in our pigeon colony. Now, when I say myocardial infarction is common in old pigeons, it is, but it is by a mechanism that's rather infrequent in human beings and that is the embolization of plaque material from the root of the aorta or high up in the coronary artery. Embolization of plaque material as a cause of coronary occlusion and myocardial infarction in man occurs only about 15% of the time, while it's almost invariably the cause of myocardial infarction in pigeons. This is the cut surface of the heart we just saw, and you can see the myocardial infarction here in the ventricular wall. And if one looks at the root of the aorta, and with a magnifying glass on this slide, you'll have to take my word for it, you can see an ulcerated plaque in the root of the aorta right here. And downstream from that, one sees the necrotic myocardium, and you can see embolic calcific material in these small coronary arteries. So we had 
plaque ulceration, the plaque contents with some of this lamella calcium went down the aorta into the coronary outflow tract, occluding the coronary artery and causing the myocardial infarction. Here's a small coronary artery with some of this lamella calcium that almost completely occludes it. One of the, while we're on coronary artery disease, uh, we ask ourselves early on whether what kind of relationship existed between aortic atherosclerosis in pigeons and the coronary artery atherosclerosis. And I can tell you that there, there is no correlation between the two. Uh, we carried out this experiment to test the hypothesis that there was no relationship between the, the occurrence of coronary and aortic atherosclerosis. The, Expected numbers would have been the ones shown here under the column expected if there was no relationship between the two. And the observed numbers were what we actually observed. And as you can see, what we actually saw and what would be expected for no relationship was essentially the same. Uh, other studies of this same sort have been done in human beings by Seymour Glockhoff at the University of Chicago and his findings were exactly the same for man, that the statistical relationships between aortic atherosclerosis and coronary artery atherosclerosis are almost non-existent. I think that's an easy thing for experimentalists to forget because aortas are so easy to take out and they're so easy to grind up and they provide you with so much tissue that experimentalists often base all of their research on the aorta. Hearts are often not examined because they're difficult and tiny and hard to deal with. And one goes jolly along their way making observations on aortic atherosclerosis, assuming at every turn that it's appropriate to generalize to coronary artery atherosclerosis. And I'm sure this is not true. That's very much the case among biochemical research and nutrition research. If you'll notice the literature, you'll often see tables only of aortic atherosclerosis with no mention of atherosclerosis in any other arterial site, such as the cerebral arteries, the coronary arteries, or the arteries of the legs. Now, in more recent years, uh, we've been endeavoring to develop some selected strains of pigeons uh, that had characteristics uh, that would be more useful in research. And it had to do with the question I mentioned earlier on of individual differences in susceptibility. And what we sought to develop in our pigeon colony was a strain derived from our parent population of white carnots that would have worsened atherosclerosis independent of the traditional risk factors. Now, we knew from our previous experiment that we could choose substrains of the total population that tended to have higher cholesterol, plasma cholesterol concentrations, and that they would then have worsened atherosclerosis, but we wanted to disassociate that phenomenon. And I think I'll dwell here for a moment on why we wanted to do that, because that will make a part of the monkey story a little easier for you to understand. <coughs> Excuse me. There are two major ways in which individuality and susceptibility to atherosclerosis uh, can be manifest. The first is in individual differences in the control of plasma lipoprotein or plasma cholesterol concentrations. That is, within a population of animals or a population of people, if you were to feed them all exactly the same diet, and it could be a, a lipid-rich diet, you would see a, a normal distribution of responses in, term, responses in terms of increases in plasma concentrations of the lipids. This individuality can, can be quite extensive some individuals can respond with by pro, rather profound increases in their plasma lipid concentrations, while others will not respond at all. Uh, we call that hyper and hypo responsiveness to dietary cholesterol, and it is a term that has rather caught on uh, even in talking about people's response to dietary cholesterol. 
Well, the kind of variability that I want to talk about here now is not that kind of variability because we know that hyper and hypo responsiveness to dietary cholesterol does occur among pigeons and monkeys and people and that when those concentrations are high, the atherosclerosis tends to be worse and when those concentrations are low, the atherosclerosis tends to be less. Well, the question that we wanted to address ourselves to was within a, within a population of animals or people whose traditional risk factors were all the same, one continues to see a great deal of variability. Now, among people who come to the autopsy room who ha all have the same blood pressures, who all have cholesterol concentrations around 200 milligrams per deciliter, let's say, some of those individuals will have quite a lot of atherosclerosis and others will have almost none. The same is true of monkeys and pigeons. Within a given dose of risk factor, wherever you set it, there will be some individuals with a great deal of atherosclerosis and some that have almost no atherosclerosis. Well, for a good many years, we and others have been trying to model that aspect of human atherosclerosis so that we could get at the basic pathogenetic mechanisms that accounted for these individual differences in susceptibility. So it was really for that reason that we set out to find a strain of, of pigeons that might serve as useful models within that particular context. And uh, we were reasonably successful in hatching out what we've called WC2. How we went about that experiment was that we set up a hundred different pairs of white carnal pigeons and we uh, simply numbered them sequentially by pair numbers and tried to identify a particular pair of pigeons that was producing the trait that we aspired to, that is worsened atherosclerosis with the same dose of risk factors as those random bred birds in the colony. Well, as you can see, since we call this one WC2, that was our number two pair of pigeons. If, if we'd known how it uh, was going to turn out, we could have only had two pairs instead of 100, and it would have worked out better. But our, our population now of WC2 pigeons have all been derived from that original pair of birds. They've been further subdivided, but I won't go into that today. But I would like to see if, to try to convince you that we have developed what we set out to develop. And in this slide, you can see the atherosclerotic index of the random population in our colony of white carnos uh, <clears throat> fed the particular diet that these birds were, were fed. The atherosclerotic index here is, is expressed as the percent of the intimal surface that had lesions. And as you can see, about 15% of the animal surface of our randomly bred birds in our colony <clears throat> had, were, were affected. A little more than twice as much animal surface is affected in the WC2 birds. That is, they had a, a little more, that being almost 35%, a little more than two times as much atherosclerosis fed the same diet for the said, same length of time. The cholesterol concentration differences are similar. There's about twice as much cholesterol. Uh, among, the, among the total cholesterol, it is the esterified cholesterol that is most strikingly increased, and there is a small increase in the phospholipids. Whoop, I thought I had one more slide after that. Is, isn't there one more slide there? <laughs> I can I, I could probably be more convincing without the slide than if the slide turns up. <laughs> because the slide is to convince you that these big differences in atherosclerosis between the random birds, yes. <clears throat> this slide is to show that when you feed them big doses of dietary cholesterol, elevate their cholesterol, and get these differences that I just showed you in the amount of atherosclerosis, uh, that this is independent of anything you can measure in the plasma. You'll recall that although they had a, about two and a half times as much atherosclerosis, their total serum cholesterol concentrations were practically identical. Their triglyceride concentrations were not significantly different. 
the amount of, of their lipoproteins that were low density lipoproteins were essentially identical and the size of their low density lipoprotein particles as evidenced by the rate in which they move by electrophoresis suggested they were identical. Uh, so we, we did conclude that we had developed a model that, uh, that would be highly useful to try to study the cellular aspects. Uh, we, we're concluding at this moment that, that the WT, WC2 strain is a strain of pigeons who has worsened atherosclerosis by some mechanisms operative at the level of the arterial wall because we can't find any ways they're different from the random population in terms of what goes on in the plasma. Now, there, there are a number of investigators that, at our institution who are trying to find out what these cellular events are in these WC2 pigeons that make them so uniquely different from their random population. Our best evidence uh, is that there are differences in the proteoglycans of the arterial wall or the kinds of proteoglycans that uh, accumulate in response to some kind of an injury. And this work is being done by Dr. Wagner and our group and he believes this particular chondroitin rich proteoglycans has a particular affinity and strong binding for low density lipoproteins and that that may be one of the principal genetic mechanisms whereby WC2 pigeons are, are different. There may be other things that have to do with their endothelial surfaces uh, in which they are also different, but that's less clearly understood. <laughs> and lastly, we've been somewhat uh, concerned and intrigued by the uh, recent observations on the chicken herpes virus and its role in atherosclerosis in that species. As most of you probably know, uh, the fabricants from the Cornell Veterinary School uh, in collaboration with Dick Minnick at the Cornell Medical School have in the past two or three years published a convincing series of papers that in summary would say that the chicken herpes virus is, is a, an essential ingredient for chicken atherosclerosis, that chickens, uh, if they're not infected with the virus, uh, will not respond to dietary cholesterol and have little or no diet-induced atherosclerosis. But if they are infected with the chicken herpes virus, uh, they have an interaction with the dietary cholesterol and thus their atherosclerosis is profoundly worse. Well, we know that our pigeon colony uh, does have the pigeon herpes virus, as, as all pigeon colonies everywhere does. The role of the pigeon herpes virus and pigeon atherosclerosis, I think, is up for anybody's grabs. And it will be uh, interesting indeed if somewhere a few years from now we find that the WC2 pigeon uh, selected as we selected it was selected for some unique susceptibility to the pigeon herpes virus or some unique way of dealing with the pigeon herpes virus. But I think the role of the pigeon herpes virus and pigeon atherosclerosis is likely to be a, a very interesting part of comparative pathology over the next five years. We're, we're not studying it. Because